Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two for this news report today, Friday, October 19th, 2012. My website is ggnonline.com and on YouTube it's ddarko2012, ddarko2013. The links will be posted in YouTube's video description so you can check them out. All right, we kind of left off right around here talking about uh, gas, right? Uh, pipelines, gas pipelines are projected to bypass Russia's gas prom saying Clinton. So there goes Clinton everywhere, man. She's going to be sparking off world wars eventually, I tell you. And you think she's going to be on the front lines? No, she won't be. She'll be in some underground bunker in Denver or something. And then we talked about Russia uh, setting up and successfully testing their ICBM. Uh, U.S. envoy revealing a secret assistance offered to Turkey to fight against the Kurds, in which the Turks uh, basically refuse. Then you have what? You have Kurdistan alliance refusing a help from Iraq's central government uh, as far as uh, the region goes with uh, the Kurds So, and Turkey. And this is right where we left off. Some 160 promising oil and gas fields discovered in Turkmenistan which ranks fourth in the world on natural gas reserves. Then uh, the last article that we left off with was U.S. military assistance to Central Asia, highly opaque. U.S. military assistance to the key Central Asian governments has increased dramatically in recent years, but remains highly unexamined according to research presented in Washington on Tuesday. The military assistance stood around 5% of all U.S. aid to the region during the 90s. Today con constitutes nearly a third of the total. He says the U.S. is especially focused on strengthening the special forces in the region's militaries, particularly Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, while significant assistance is also going towards non-lethal equipment and some light weapons. Very soon, the military aid to these countries is going to enter a new phase as the U.S. starts to pull its forces out of Afghanistan by 2014. Now, even though they just said they're going to keep them there beyond, it has said that it intends to leave some of that equipment behind for its Central Asian partners. And that was what, Uzbekistan, I think they wanted to have a base to store that. Uh, we don't know yet what kind of equipment that will be. Ex-British SAS and ex-JP Morgan Chase members are on the hunt for Afghan gold. The two former members of the UK's SAS, the highly regarded British Army Special Forces Unit, are nowadays closely involved in exploring for and mining gold in Afghanistan. Perhaps it is the type of military experience that is necessary in developing the mineral resources of such a potentially hostile geographically and politically area of the world. U.S. studies drawing heavily on previous Soviet geological findings that come up with Afghan mineral resources which could be worth in excess of $1 trillion, including copper, iron, ore, gold, huge deposits of lithium, rare earths, and others. The general who planned the Afghan surge is heading to Africa. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta on Thursday nominated a former senior commander in Afghanistan as the new head of the military's AFRICOM, or Africa Command, which oversees U.S. security efforts on the continent. But remember this article down here, and it goes down and says, it's not just a matter of economic competition, as important as that is, it's also a matter of national and international security. Of what? Of their monopolies. <laughs> so whether it has to do with Afghanistan, or Africa, that's what they're doing. So when they talk about overseeing the U.S. security efforts, they're talking about overseeing their um, their monopolies. So the change in leadership comes amid growing concerns over Al-Qaeda's affiliates in the region, particularly in Mali. That's what I was talking about recently. France has just tried to uh, uh, draw up a treaty or some kind of bill to uh, declare, you know, military operations there and a deadly attack on the U.S. Uh, consulate in Libya. Uh, but I also linked that to what? Uh, right around that area, they have large uh, reserves of gold, I believe it was. And so it's, that's what it's all about. And in Somalia, they're trying to finish that uh, that operation up, that economic operation, so they can get the oil drilling going. Liberia, I remember I covered this before. Uh, report reveals why Ellen wants AFRICOM in Liberia. Reports gathered by this paper have revealed that the Liberian president's interest in hosting Liberia as a base for the U.S.'s AFRICOM appears to have had more to do with protecting George Soros and Rothschild's mining operations in West Africa than in championing stability and human rights. The, re the report indicates that for the sole purpose of protecting the Soros and Rothschild's mining operations in West Africa, the president and her friend received two Nobel gold medals to help the Rothschild Soros team control all the gold medal. It says a little gold for all the gold. 
Uh, Generals for Hire scandal, former top brass film discussing how to set up huge arm deals with the MOD. Several generals caught in newspaper sting. The retired top brass boasted of ability to multi-million pound arms deals. So they're reported to have boasted about lobbying top officials to secure contracts for private firms. This is what they do, you know. Um, so, you know, I was talking about this general here is heading to Africa, right? So it's about security of uh, resources for these big global corporations and the Rothschilds and all that and the Soros uh, and uh, generals for hire. Remember Wesley Clark, the one that was actually warning people about, uh, well, not really warning, but, uh, you know, talking about how he had heard an insider talking about taking one country after another, like dominoes, Syria and Lebanon, and eventually Iran after Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, he was the same one that, what, goes from four-star general to reality TV punchline. Stars earn their stripes. So, yeah, he was part of that to promote the uh, the global military police force. And we're talking about these generals boasting over here about lobbying top officials to secure contracts for private firms. Well, that's what the media is all about, right? The Superman reboot will be Pentagon Stealth Jet's silver screen debut. The Pentagon has picked next week's Summer Man of Steel film to be the cinematic debut of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the most expensive weapons program in human history. At least we're told that. It was a target of opportunity, said the Pentagon's Hollywood liaison. There you go. Beirut bomb kills anti-Syrian intelligence official. So a prominent Lebanese intelligence official says opposed to Assad was killed in a huge car bomb in Beirut in another sign, blah, 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 blah. He says uh, he was a Sunni Muslim who was close to Hari, also held or helped uncover a bomb plot that led to the arrest indictment in August of a pro-Assad former Lebanese minister. The bombing was the most serious to hit the capital since Hari's 2005 assassination prompted Sunni Muslims to take to the streets across the country, burning tires and blocking roads and show of sectarian anger. So, um, major official, who benefits here, you know what I mean? It ain't going to be the people that supposedly did it. Major, major official assassinated in Lebanon blasts Major General. His death is a big, big event, advisor to Prime Minister says. So they say some observers fear the attack is a sign of violence in Syria could spill into the country. One Christian lawmaker said it's designed to start a civil war. So... Hezbollah condemns a deadly Beirut car bomb attack. Lebanon's resistant movement, Hezbollah, has condemned the deadly car bomb attack in the capital, which killed at least eight people and injured scores of others. The intelligence chief of Lebanon's internal security forces is reported to be among those killed in the blast. He had recently uncovered an Israeli spy cell in Lebanon. So Syria condemned the attack as a cowardly move. An explosion occurred in Beirut's eastern district, predominantly a Christian district. Commodore said that Al-Hawri's immediate statement blaming Syria indicates that he has more inside knowledge than anyone else. So yeah, it's kind of like the Turkish shelling, right? They knew right away and said, oh yeah, you know, Syria apologized. The Western and Zionist Israel agents are trying to cause unrest in Lebanon. Hope all of Lebanese will stay united to defeat the enemy. So this is interesting. This is just after the drone over Israel that um, I think even Hezbollah took um, credit for. But either way, the West was pushing it. And then, of course, you have, what, the chemical weapons linked to Hezbollah in Syria. So they're really building that case hard. Uh, probably because they can, you know, when they declare it a terrorist organization, or they can consider it, then they can go along those lines instead of the humanitarian uh, humanitarian option. The protest and gunfire in Lebanon after the Beirut killing sends Sunni Muslims to take to the streets, so it's getting pretty bad there. Ban Ki-moon, Hezbollah's launch of Iranian drone into Israel could lead to regional war, which is probably what they wanted. The UN report blasts Hezbollah for threatening Lebanon's stability, involvement in Syria conflict, and also criticizes Israel for violating Lebanese air airspace. They throw that little nugget in there, even though they do it every single day. Nothing happens. So there's actually exercises going on right now. Um, the United States has a, a decent amount of ships, like three big warships, um, aircraft carriers, I think, over there. Uh, they're doing uh, exercises. Um, also, Iran is doing their own exercises in the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, so it's getting kind of tense right now. I mean... Uh, Iranian, a good false flag uh, uh, environment. Iranian general threatens definite retaliation to any Israeli strike. So they say an attack by the Zionist regime would be an opportunity to destroy that regime. 
Their defense mechanism is not planned for big and long wars. Their threats are only psychological, and if they cross the limit or act upon those threats, Israel will definitely be destroyed. Then you have this. U.S. NGOs are covert government agencies. NBC News has published a lengthy story on the so-called non-profit and non-governmental organizations calling itself United Against Nuclear Iran, or UANI, that sits behind security locked doors in an unmarked office high above midtown Manhattan and wages economic warfare against the Islamic Republic of Iran. Part of what the group does is psychological warfare. It pays for a billboard high above the Times Square, takes shots at the Iranian president, and plays a bow up Ahmadinejad punching bag doll outside Hotel Warwick when he stayed there recently. His core mission is lobbying anti Iran sanctions and intimidating American and international companies from doing business with the country. As far as humanitarian nature of the whole uh, uni activity, many experts point out that even if the sanctions look successful, they're primarily targeting ordinary Iranians and not the Iranian leadership. A fellow at the New American Foundation says that it's profoundly immoral and it's punishing the innocent. They say, what do the people have to do with the government? It is weakening the people of Iran. We are making it harder for them to change their government. Sanctions empower criminal elements and make it harder to... A civil society to operate, making it harder for Iran to become a real democracy. It goes on, it says it calls itself a nonprofit NGO, but is headed by Mark Wallace, a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations and close associate to Senator John McCain, the neocon. It says it compromises former heads of the CIA, the Counterterrorism Office of the National Security Council, and the Mossad, Israel, Israel's National Intelligence Agency. So whatever the cover-up may be, this organization, this NGO, is definitely pursuing the objectives put forward by the U.S. government. And a neocon cognitive infiltrator, this foul alternative media figures peddle neocon agenda and sits on advisory groups with the PNAC signatories. Joseph Farah and his World Net Daily project attempts to fill a niche, straddling the alternative media and feeding inquiry minds back into servitude towards the greater corporate financier agenda. Some of these talking points include the neocon wars of aggression, particularly against Iran. It also goes on and says, in essence, Farah and the World Net Daily are the right wing of Cass Sunstein's cognitive infiltration, a policy described in Sunstein's paper, Conspiracy Theories as the infiltration of extremist groups aiming to introduce informational diversity into such groups. Amongst these strategies includes hiring people to actively infiltrate segments of society that hold alternative views and introduce informational diversity to lure them back into the mainstream paradigm. Sunstein was actually the administrator of the Office of Information. So yeah, it says here that um, Although he works for the Obama regime, many mistake that his strategies are only meant to be applied from the left. They are indeed applied from the right as well. It goes on and it says that uh, what they're doing here is posturing themselves in the fashion of alternative media, selling talking points quite literally pulled from the papers, policies, and speeches given by prominent neoconservatives and nonpartisan corporate financier funded and driven policy think tanks. So it's here that Farrer himself is directly involved with his political clique, having served upon the U.S. Committee for a Free Lebanon, created specifically to array foreign-backed opposition against the governments of Syria and Iran, as well as Hezbollah and its supporters in Lebanon, all slated for removal by corporate financier interests, according to U.S. Army General Wesley Clark. Upon the committee sitting alongside Joseph Farah of World Net Daily was Chairman Zaid Abdil Nour, a Lebanese corporate financier, says here, that an interview faking the case against Syria, he exclaimed both the Syrian and Lebanese regimes will be changed, whether they like it or not, whether it's going to be a military coup or something else, and we are working on it. We know already exactly who's going to be the replacements. The Assad regime is going to go whether it's true or not. He says, I don't care what the excuse is. There's no room for rogue states in the world, whether we lie about it or invent something or we don't. I don't care. Kind of like the Israeli lobbyists about attacking Iran, how they need a false flag attack. He was the president of the Arab Bankers Association of North America, but it says the list consists of an impressive list of non-Arab corporate financiers, including Bank of America, Dow Jones, Goldman Sachs, all the usual suspects. One analyst says U.S. is committing a holocaust for regime change in Iran. They're jeopardizing the lives of millions of patients in Iran by trying to achieve the grand illusion of installing a pro-West regime in the country. Iranian nurses are leaving the country, local hospitals. In panic as Iran has experienced a shortage of nurses who leave the country on a daily basis because of low salaries while abroad they're getting paid more than in Iran.
A suicide bomber kills two guards at a South Iran mosque. The Sunni rebel group Jandala took responsibility.